Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the AAS YouTube channel. This is part of the good stuff. This is the AAS Journal Author Series, and I am very happy to have Val Eslan in with us today. Hello, Val. Hi there. Um, those are some great equations over your right shoulder. <laughs> those are pretty famous. <laughs> yes, they were in no way uh, planted there. In oh, of course not. Business. Never, never, um, never. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so we we uh, we will be uh, I'll be mentioning some of uh, magneto hydrodynamics, uh, a bit of plasma physics, a bit of electromagnetism. Um, so we we will uh, just briefly touch on that uh, and see some of the applications, some of these equations in the wild. Uh, in the wild, well, okay, very good. Uh, and Val, where where are you located at? What's your geolocation? Uh, yes, yeah, so right now I'm in uh, the city of Dundee, the original one in Scotland, United Kingdom. <laughs> uh, so, and I'm in uh, at our, a lovely uh, school of science and engineering here. Um, I am part of the uh, mathematics division here. Uh, so we we do a lot of applied mathematics, but as you'll see, we do very much like to uh, relate that uh, rather abstract, uh, those abstract notions to the real world, and you will see some uh, real world examples. Very cool. Uh, let's see, Dundee, we're fairly far, got a northern latitude there. Is there snow in Dundee? Do you get snow? Uh, there is some snow right now. Um, we are, uh, of course, well, we have the Gulf Stream, of course, so it's, it's maybe not as as uh, cold as some of the, the latitudes uh, mm -hmm. in, in the US, uh, equivalently. Um, uh, we we it, it does get dark quite early. Oh yeah. Um, we I think are just about out of out of the range of latitudes where you can observe the ISS uh, with the naked eye. So nice, nice. Just 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 uh, yeah, out. So I, I do have to go south to see the ISS. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's see. It is January eighteenth, twenty twenty four, as we record this, and I'm in Phoenix, and Phoenix is definitely in its winter mode. Um, so we get a little above freezing in the morning, and then it will warm up to a, a very pleasant day. So it's all good. And Val, what do you like to do for research? Uh, well, uh, I I have a background in plasma physics. Mm -hmm. um, I was, began uh, almost a lifetime ago, uh, but it doesn't seem that long. Maybe it does seem longer uh, in uh, the uh, study of controlled fusion, mm. uh, but now I have moved on to uh, to a, a as people tell me a working fusion reactor, studying yes. our <laughs> very own sun yes. um, and many other the, the a model for many other uh, fusion reactors, many other stars, of course, in our uh, universe. Uh, so uh, uh, I'm studying um, the sun specifically the. Uh, the uh, sort of outer layers of the sun, the the sun's atmosphere, the sun's corona, and that's what we're going to be uh, discussing today. Cool. So let's go ahead and, and get into it. And let's see, I'm going to do a share desktop on this one. And there we go. This one is an APJ letter. It is open access. It's the open access era. People, go ahead and grab a copy for free. A near half-century simulation of the solar corona. And Val, take us away. Uh, yes, uh, so thank you. So first of all, I would certainly like to th uh, thank and acknowledge my co-authors. Uh, my boss, uh, Karen Mayer here at Dundee, is also um, a lot of experience studying uh, solar phenomena. Um, uh, I have uh, a close collaborator, Roger Scott, who's currently at the US Naval Research Laboratory, but he was also previously here at Dundee. And I'll, I'll highlight um, a, a particular uh, piece of work he's done um, for this. And finally, uh, our collaborator, Anthony Yates, um, at the at Durham University, Durham, again, the, the UK one, not the uh, yes. <laughs> American one, I'm afraid to say the original and the best, perhaps. Um, and again, I'll, I'll very much highlight um, his part uh, in this. So um, I'll, I'll point out what they've done. So if you don't mind, I'll, I'll jump straight into it. Absolutely. So, um, as I mentioned, we're, we're going to be talking about uh, the sun and we're going to be talking about the sun's corona. So this is the uh, the region just above that uh, burning ball of gas that you normally see. Uh, mm -hmm. This is a, a region, of course, uh, filled with plasma, uh, but it is one which is dominated by the magnetic field 
of the sun. Uh, and indeed, there is an interaction, of course, between the plasma and the magnetic field, the mutual uh, sort of interaction. Uh, yeah. And uh, so it's utterly dominated by the magnetic field. And so the way to model this region, um, there are there are a couple of established approaches. So on the one hand, uh, you have what is called the uh, potential uh, field approach. So this is one where uh, you largely ignore uh, the influence of the plasma. It's it's also called a force-free approach or current-free approach. So you largely ignore that plasma with the exception of, you're probably familiar, that there is a solar wind, an outflow of plasma from the sun. So that's the only way that the plasma is kept in that model. And other than that, it is basically a magnetostatic model. Yeah. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. And um, it, it's a model where, um, because you're not considering the effects of the plasma, you are not considering the history either. So you can kind of take a single snapshot and simulate the whole corona without knowing what has happened before or what will happen in the future. You just have this snapshot. And that, of course, is that's a double-edged sword. On the one hand, you're missing some of this dynamics. Of course, there is histor a history and a hysteresis within the corona. And on the other hand, uh, on the other hand, on the, on the positive side, though, because you don't need to know all that history, you can uh, run this model very quickly. Yeah. On the complete other end of the scale, you have the magnetohydrodynamic approach, which should be familiar to all sorts of plasma uh, physicists and, and other researchers. Um, so this treats the plasma as a fluid, which interacts uh, self-consistently with the magnetic field. Okay. Uh, and uh, you know, and these these models can get almost limitlessly complex and complicated. <laughs> so you know, you can have the, a volume the size of my little finger uh, filled with plasma being simulated by an entire supercomputer for you know for only a, a point one of a second or so of, of real time it might take you days. It can get really really complicated. Of course, it doesn't have to be that way. But right. the magnetohydrodynamic models they are very uh, intensive and and uh, complicated. Indeed, and um, and so, and what we have is a magneto friction model. I'll talk about that in just a moment. But the the long and short of it is this: lets us keep some of those dynamics, but it also uh, is simple enough that we can run it quickly enough that we, as the title suggests, we have done a uh, we have simulated the uh, the solar corona for a total of forty seven years continuously mm -hmm. with time resolutions of of order seconds so nice you know a time step every few seconds nice it's dynamic so each time step informs the next one there is a history there time step to time step mm -hmm. um so clearly uh that's a, a very large and interesting data set there that we have you know that sort of small resolution the whole corona uh in a whole uh, in a single uh, case for that length of time and so then let me let me ask what is the um what is the spatial resolution um, so that, so we we have about uh, it, it actually does say it uh, lower down, but it's about okay. one degree. Um, so one degree in in the two angular directions. Okay. And okay. then uh, we have sixty. So you know it's it's enough, and you'll see you'll see some of the effects here. So it's you know it's not the the tiniest resolution. It's not the size of my little finger by any means, but it is enough to capture some of the important dynamics. Cool. Um, and uh, so. The, the the real purpose or one of the main purposes of this uh, letter is to kind of make the scientific community aware of this and more importantly to solicit uh, suggestions, collaborations, you know feedback, etc. How can we use this data set and this study to help you answer some of your science questions? What can yeah. we do with this? We have a lot of ideas. We have you know we're writing um, several longer, more involved articles to follow this up cool. but we would definitely like to to hear from you um any any suggestions from the, from the scientific community may your inbox fill up <laughs> um so what is this uh magneto frictional approach that we have taken and uh there's a code that's been developed called dumfric um to solve this so the idea is um to take the magneto hydrodynamic equations which as i say they have a fluid component Mm -hmm. And uh, to basically ignore the, or, or rather uh, simplify the uh, inertial term. Yeah. So there's an inertial term in the uh, MHD equation, and we'll simplify that into a, a frictional term. So what this means, firstly, it means that we can eliminate the, okay. uh, the density. We don't need to worry about the density right. anymore. There's just a friction, the, 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 you know, the, the, 
the bulk of the plasma just causes a friction. And what it also means is we can eliminate the velocity mm. as an independent parameter, as an independent variable. Um, right. And you can see there in equation two that the velocity now it's becomes getting... just a function of the magnetic field. So right. as I mentioned, the magnetic field is, is dominant. So we have subordinated all the other variables to it. We solve just for the mag uh, magnetic field. We can either, well, in fact, we solve through the um, through the uh, vector potential. But as you know, uh, if you're if you're familiar with this, as you know that from mm -hmm. the vector potential, we can very readily get the magnetic field itself. Yep. So, um, so as I say, we've effectively eliminated the the density and the fluid velocity as a uh, as an independent variable. We're solving just for the magnetic field, uh, but we get this dynamic effect and i'll uh, so i'll show you uh, this and, and and all of this has been we have developed all this into you know working code now i should also say the 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 t the word we uh, that i just used there in the last few sentences is doing a lot of heavy lifting so um this the development of this code has been uh you know a decadal work by uh, our co-author Anthony Yeats uh, and of course many others involved with him at uh, Durham University. Um, so um, nice. uh, and we've we've included uh, we've included references to some of the earlier works. If you want to know more about the the technical impl implementation, some of the mathematics, the history, etc., you can read cool. uh, some of those past papers and and, and other references therein. Okay, nice. Good. So ah, here's my um, from the question. There we go. Yes, exactly. So there is a there is a, and you can see it's the mm -hmm. in radius we we're logarithmic and so on. So this is this is fairly standard for this kind of model. Okay. Mm -hmm. So as I mentioned, um, yeah, if you'd like to go to figure one, if you don't mind, figure one, um, absolutely. So as I mentioned, we have forty seven years of data of magnetic field, and uh, we can infer from it the velocity. Um, uh, as you are probably aware, even if you're you know not um, super into uh, coronal physics, you're probably aware that uh, the sun, there are these things called coronal mass emissions or fla solar flares. So mm -hmm. very frequently there are these giant, enormous uh, expulsions of, of plasma from the sun, these violent, very rapid events uh, that happen. Uh, they happen quite regularly. You know, we're talking every week, every month, etc. It, it varies. We'll, we'll talk about that in a moment. But sure. these happen yeah. very frequently. So we had better hope that in our model, you know, uh, in these 47 years, we had better hope that there are, you know, hundreds of these. And indeed, there are. Cool. So indeed, there are hundreds of eruptions and, and various other dynamic events happening and so one thing that uh, when i was looking at this one thing that i wanted to do is to try and localize each of these in space and in time so we could uh, you know we have this kind of almost a semi-automated way of detecting we've got an eruption that happened on this exact day uh in this exact location and of course then we want to check that against uh you know against real records right um, so what I've added to this code, um, if you look in the, the bottom right of this figure, so uh, panel D, mm -hmm. um, what I've done is I've taken the yeah. outer, uh, if you imagine that this is the outer boundary, so there's a sphere that encompasses our simulation, encompasses our corona. Okay. And what I've done with that sphere is I've split this up into, um, into yeah. parts. Uh, these are strictly called caps so if you imagine mm -hmm. a kind of dome right a dome like shell so part of a sphere mm -hmm. um Over here. that kind of would form mm -hmm. a dome if you took it off this is right. a, called a, a a spherical cap yes I'd, a, you can have various ones with different sort of it's, it's, it's kind of the end of a cone right you could think of it as the end of a cone so you can have a various opening mm -hmm. angles and right. so on and so i right. picked one and i what i've done is i've uh, broken up uh you know just in terms of computation i broke not, not in terms of the actual grid just but i have kind of yeah um yeah. I, I have grouped parts of it into these caps i've I've kind of stuck a bunch of caps onto mm -hmm. the outside of our uh of our simulation domain i'm with you and within each of these caps as a function of time, I'm calculating a quantity. Um, uh, I'll, I'll explain what this is in a moment, but uh, it's uh, it's called a helicity um, flux. Well, I'll, I'll yes. talk about that. But yes. basically, for each cap, I have a quantity as a function of time. So you can see an example of that in panel B. Right. And this quantity, um, just by uh, 
you know, by deduction and also by just observation, having having uh, you know played around with this and and run this, this quantity shows a peak exactly when an eruption happens. And and um, uh, so most specifically, uh, it, it might actually help here if you if you went uh, to the movie of this. Yeah, we got some very cool animations in this article, and so let's go ahead and pull up the first one here, and away we go. Yes. So. Um, as, we, as, as it shows there, we have we have a, a time period of three days, uh, and we are on the cap. You can see on on the in the figure on the left, we have this cap. So within that cap, we have this quantity that's changing. Um, and what I'm showing is I'm showing a number of magnetic field lines that are evolving within this. Uh, within our simulation that these magnetic field lines go through that cap and what you'll see you'll see just in a moment there what you'll see is you see the magnetic field lines twist themselves into this yes. bird's nest yes and this bird's nest is then expelled out of the simulation domain so that that of course is, is quite realistic in in uh in the real sun we'd expect uh eruptions to happen where indeed this is what happens the magnetic field sort of twists itself up and material and those magnetic field lines are ex effectively expelled outwards into the broader solar system so reconnection Going now on? there is reconnection happening, and and uh, you know this is um, uh, so. In order to have that, in order for a um, a magnetic field line, I'll probably talk about that in a subsequent figure. But in yeah. order for a magnetic field line to first be connected to the sun and eventually disconnect and be expelled in that way, there it has to be magnetic reconnection. And uh, this is you know of course not all models capture that. The PFSS model would not be able to capture that. Okay. Uh, we can do with winter frictional. This clearly shows that. Uh, but yes. yeah, so some of these magnetic field lines, they reconnect, they get expelled out and an cool. eruption happens. And I, I should stress that this is, um, you know, I'm showing a, a period of three days, but there, these are three kind of real calendar days that, yes. uh, mm -hmm. you know, we could look up, et cetera, and uh, they, you know, really happened. Um, so now this eruption yeah. is driven. Um, uh, you can also see in the, in the, uh, plot on the left, the actual sphere itself, the sphere of the sun, uh, is colored by the radial magnetic field. Okay. Okay. And ah, you can okay. um, so you can see that uh, so the the the, the extreme uh, bright and extreme dark uh, are the the most intense. So where you have a, a dark patch or a, a bright patch. That's the most intense magnetic field. And you can see that the, the magnetic field lines, the, where that sort of bird's nest of uh, material appears, um, it, it begins at um, a pair of like a, a sort of, you know, a bright region next to a dark region. This is what's called an active region. Yes. So, of course, um, you need to, um, you know, uh, one of these equations up there tells you that you have to have a negative polarity for every positive polarity right so you have no magnetic monopoles so um, right. a, an active region is a region on the sun oh, of uh hopefully balanced positive uh, and negative but strong in both cases so net zero but uh strong in, oh, in either strong. direction yeah um a magnetic field this is magnetic field that has sort of bubbled its way up it was uh it's it was generated inside the sun there were some turbulent motion uh some currents were created and this was bubbled its way to the surface of the sun um this would have been observed by a you know a, a, a an observatory on earth or in space we, we have certain sources and this effectively forms a boundary condition to our model so we we need someone to go out there and observe and see um where these active regions these regions of strong magnetic field emerge from the sun and then we take that as an input to our right. model and what we produce then is something like this we show what happens to the magnetic field then in the corona cool and so generally not always um but generally these kind of eruptions and flares and things are caused by these active regions these regions of intense magnetic field cool very nice beautiful um but uh, so the 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 thing here is that this approach um of of calculating this quantity I'll, again i'll come to that in a second but this quantity the uh helicity flux uh this can be calculated in, um uh, from the magnetic field yes and as you can see 
it causes a spike exactly uh, as the eruption okay. passes through the outer simulation domain. And this approach, by the way, could be taken and used in a, something like an MHD model, you know, or any other model. So, it, it, you know, this this could be readily transferred yeah. to a more complicated model. It should work there, and it should tell you the time that an eruption is happening. And it should also, because you've broken up your uh, your uh, outer boundary into these caps, it should tell you where it's happening. So you can yes. very readily, you know, you can say it's it's happening right here. If I can somewhat digress, uh, when I was making this, um, I was sort of thinking of, uh, you know, the, uh, the Star Trek TV show. Um, I was sort of thinking, you know, you might be uh, sort of uh, sitting there, you know, saying, Captain, we have an, uh, an eruption in Sector 3G or something, you know. Um, um, so that, that's the kind of idea here. We, we, can, <laughs> we can sort of localize this as if you were, you know, a captain of a starship. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. and those, those spherical caps are, you know, the, the protective layer and, you know, protect it all. It's very cool. Good, good. Yeah, exactly. So uh, anyway, but this is, so this is approach lets us uh, localize in time and in space yeah. any eruptions of which we have many in our, in our model. Um, now, what is this? Uh, what is this uh, is quantity here? This H with a um, dot. H dot. Um, if you go back to the uh, to the paper that's that's defined, uh -huh. if you go back. It was up a little bit. H dot. There's your... Yeah, exactly. Um, so um, this is to do with the change in magnetic helicity. Yes. Um, so the, and the magnetic helicity is a is a sort of twist. Uh, of the magnetic field. I won't go too far into uh, detail. Again, there are references and so on that you can read. But the important thing here is that you can calculate this from local quantities on that cap. So you, you know, in yes. practice, if you are running a simulation, all you need to know is about the local plasma quantities at the outside of the uh, of your simulation domain. And then you can, you know, only choose the ones in a particular area, a particular cap that'll uh, and it's an instantaneous quantity so that will tell you uh what is happening and you only need to know a kind of instantaneous time slice in order to be able to compute this quantity very cool okay all right so big one we um i think that's all i have to say about that so we can move on to figure two yeah um, yeah zoom out so people can see a global of this so this is the mean electric current densities okay and other things uh, yeah so what this is this is now a uh this is basically you know a, a, a snapshot of our entire simulation so we you can see that on the on the um the labels on the x-axis are years so this is you know this is running right. from uh 1976 to uh you know somewhere into 2023 cool. um so uh th this is kind of our, our simulation as i mentioned uh we take as a as an input as a boundary condition. We take these uh, these active regions that emerge uh, from the the inside of the interior of the sun, and yeah. so in gray um, is given for every month or so. Uh, in gray is given the amount of emerging flux. Now, again, as as I mentioned, technically uh, this would be the modulus of the flux, right? Because uh, Technically, yeah. you have zero flux at any given time. It has to be balanced by right. uh, by Maxwell's equations. But uh, this is the amount of magnetic flux uh, that's emerging from the sun in a number of active regions. Yes, these emerge. Uh, you know when they emerge, but uh, and we take them as an input. We we rely on observations either from, as I mentioned, the Earth or or there are now space based observations. Parker. Yeah, that uh, that that gives give us observations of where and when active regions are emerging. We take them as an input, and when we calculate, uh, of course, the magnetic field as I mentioned in the corona, but we can draw out. Uh, and again, this is this happens potentially at every time step. So we right. have this with a a few seconds of resolution. We have quantities such as uh, I have here in blue the average electric current through the corona. Uh, mm -hmm. These are both scaled just to, to be on the same uh, scales. Uh, you know, I can I can provide absolute values, of course, but um, sure. just to, to kind of give an indication here that they're scaled. And in red is the total magnetic energy uh, okay. in the corona at any okay. given time. Okay. Um, uh, so 
um, these uh, uh, these have both a short and a long term trend. So the the long term trend is one that should be probably familiar to to uh, people who are you know familiar with the sun, is that yeah. in the sun there is a, a roughly eleven year cycle. So I'm I'm labeling by um, what is you know it's, it's a global cycle number. This is this began with the work of Carrington observing right. the sun. So uh, in the seventies we're in cycle twenty one and so on. So there is a global cycle where at the start of each cycle there is a general minimum in the emerging flux there is a quiet period there's not much solar activity and as we go through the cycle we ramp up uh, you know crescendo to a max uh, roughly in the middle of each cycle and then decay away again right so that that's a generic um uh, that's a generic feature of the sun uh, but of course, then what we uh, are calculating is how the sun responds to that. So we, are, um, with each of those emerging active regions, we inject magnetic energy into the system. Yes. And then some of it decays away as as these eruptions happen, as they e eject, uh, you know, and, and straighten the magnetic field. Some of that uh, energy then decays away, and we create we stir up electric currents in the corona. Mm, uh, yes which uh, also it, on a on a broad scale the, the the currents of the magnetic energy take their peaks when the um, when the solar activity but you can also see a very kind of short scale um, very short scale activity so for example that mm -hmm. the the current there you know it's very spiky very sort of um, oscillatory yep so each of those spikes broadly speaking not always but um, those spikes typically correspond to those eruptions that i showed you so okay. you know when there's a when there's a ramping up of the current you'll have some sort of uh activity uh and they are driven uh, by uh by emerging active regions no though not always and this is something that uh, i haven't put this on this plot but it's quite interesting to see if we overplot also uh, specifically, uh, if we, we zoom in and we look at when do the active regions emerge, sometimes as soon as an active region emerges, you get a spike in the current. But sometimes, uh, active re you know, you might get a spike in current, but then you have uh, when there are no emerging active regions, okay. you'll also get a spike in the current. You may get an eruption that is delayed. And that, of course, happens in the real sun, too. You, you yeah. Sometimes you have an active region that has emerged. Okay. It's maybe quite quiet for a while, but then only then do you get some activity happening. So we kind of uh, pick this, uh, this these aspects up as well. Cool. Um, now, we also, what I've done here just as a very, you know, very simple bit of data analysis and, and sort of filtering is what I've done is I've, uh, you can see there at the bottom of the, the blue curves, which yeah. are the current, I have a little yellow... Um, mm -hmm a yellow line that sort of what i've tried to do there is a kind of take the minima or you know fit to the minima to, to sort of lay a baseline uh -huh. Uh -huh. for the uh for the current uh -huh. um, okay got it uh and so then so we have a long term and slowly varying baseline and yes. we have uh we have the the actual spikes of current above that so you can see uh a particular you know just less than a month uh a, a detail there of uh what happens this this is where an active region will emerge you have the mm -hmm. both the energy and the current spiking okay. um but you can see just how that spike goes above that yellow sort of baseline that i've just uh, you know fit to the to the curve which lets us then you know if we subtract that baseline then we can see exactly when and and relatively how strong each uh, current peak is nice so that that again helps us to to sort of process that it helps us to uh, say when exactly we have an eruption and then we, we, then we can look into that helicity uh, flux uh, mm -hmm. and and uh, and you know look at all the caps and so on and see when we get an eruption so nice. um, Beautiful. so Beautiful. that that kind of, so this forms the the uh, uh, the data set the core data set for uh, this simulation which as you can see is a, a good half century nearly of of solar activity that's awesome. Very good. Okay. Okay. Um, now, so what we really want to do is to fit uh, some, you know, to, to really compare this to uh, actual solar activity, of course, you know, it's all well and good 
uh, running models. So here I've attempted to compare uh, an eruption that happens within our model to uh, an eruption and, and solar activity that happened and was recorded for it. So in the in the top right figure, uh, panel C, we have a real image of the sun. Now, firstly, if you're listening to this, please do me a favor. Never look directly at the sun. Okay. It will damage your eyes. And, even even when there's an eclipse coming. <laughs> even when there's an eclipse coming. It'll damage your eyes and it'll damage your telescope and, and so on. Uh, if you aren't careful, if you aren't using the correct uh, Filter. uh, you know, filters and so on. Yeah. Uh, now, if you did have those filters and you looked at the sun, you still wouldn't see quite what yeah. we have there in the top right, because what we have there is uh, a, an image in the extreme ultraviolet part right. of the spectrum. Uh, our eyes aren't sensitive to this, and uh, the, this light doesn't get through the atmosphere anyway, so you would have to go to space with special instruments to see this, which is exactly what's happened. So we are seeing the uh, extreme ultraviolet emission from the sun. Mm -hmm. uh, it is emitted largely from areas of plasma that are hot and dense, relatively speaking. Yes. So you know, you 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 see a quite a, a a difference, right? You you see quite a bit a lot of structure there in the sun, yeah. and in particular, yes, you can see uh, the the brighter regions uh, are uh, regions of of uh, higher and hotter plasma, high density and hotter plasma, and they happen to be these uh, active regions, regions with intense magnetic fields. So yes, you're you're highlighting there in the, in the bottom sort of middle left slightly uh, that sort of triangle of of really bright material yes those yes. are a pair of active regions there's also uh in the top right there are a couple the sort of uh, it's kind of almost almost turned away from us in the bottom yeah. right there's a region so, right. so there are a few active regions here at this time this is at a particular time this is um uh, on uh, the 8th of september 2021 at a, you know that that image is taken an exact time uh you know so a, a tangible time if you like that that you can look up uh so we, we have we have active regions on the sun and i'm particularly uh focusing here on the one that's just south of the equator uh, in the sort of middle that those pair in fact of active regions there yeah um and so mm -hmm. uh, 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 uh it might be worthwhile now to go to the to the animated version of this sure. just so you can see what happens let's, there let's put this in motion and window figure two and here we go bang ah. so this is from the perspective of the earth so relative to the earth the sun is turning first of all which mm -hmm. you'll see and and, and our, the the simulation view is is kind of calibrated for that and so what you're seeing in our simulation on the say the the uh, left there is you know, i'm showing a bunch of magnetic field lines and what what's happening is that the, at the First, the magnetic field lines are in these closed loops. They leave the sun and come back to it. But as an active region in our model emerges, these uh, magnetic field lines open up. They yeah. sort of force themselves open. Uh, they they become uh, they start at the sun and now they're they're open to to go out into the wider uh, solar system. So this is this is again what happens in an eruption. You have closed magnetic field lines and they open up this uh, this is a process that uh, requires uh, magnetic reconnection Indeed. which we have in our model cool. uh, and it is a it, it, it uh, involves as i mentioned it involves going from a closed this kind of closed loop of a, a magnetic field line to an open one because plasma follows those field lines when you have an open field line the plasma is then free to stream out into the wider solar system. So what I'm showing in the bottom middle kind of panel here cool. is I'm showing firstly there there's a there's an orange sun there that that corresponds to you know the the that uh, sun ball. of course um, but yeah the ball of the sun the photosphere and so on um, and what I'm showing around that is a 3D surface that's obviously varying in time. And this 3D surface is what I call the last closed flux surface. So this is a, uh, an imaginary surface around the sun, okay. inside which, so inside it are the closed field lines. Right. And outside it, as we, where we are, where we're seeing it, are the open field lines. Mm -hmm. So plasma mm -hmm. is able to stream 
towards us, you know, at, at the earth or wherever, it's able to stream from the regions where the where we can see through to the orange ball. That is regions where there is an, a field, a, an open field, and it goes from us to the sun. Everything underneath this sort of uh, surface there, the surface is covered, it's colored by uh, how far away from the sun it is, so far by the, the solar radius there. Um, everything inside it is cl is closed, all the magnetic field lines are closed, and so the plasma, in principle, should be confined. So inside that, uh, inside that volume that's that's enclosed by this uh, by this surface, yes. the, there should be a relatively dense, relatively hot plasma that's confined. It cannot leave the sun. In principle, what we are seeing though is uh, is the dynamics there. We're seeing how there's this sort of, uh, of course, what's what's happening. We know is there's an eruption happening. What we're seeing is that um, that last closed flux surface is kind of bulges outwards and then sort of it's like a balloon it inflates uh -huh. and then it pops back down so uh, magnetic the the closed magnetic field lines kind of extend outwards and then they reconnect then they then material is left to uh to be expelled and it sort of retreats back down so this is a kind of the bottom there is a kind of way to to sort of visualize what is happening at a, at a glance what is happening to the magnetic field and uh, where, um, where, for example, the plasma is trapped and where it is not trapped. So, right. Um, so, roughly, yeah, it's about two and a half times the solar radius where that confined surface is. And of course, uh, right. Now, the, now the, the, the maximum there is in some ways a model parameter because, because we only simulate out to two and a half solar oh. radii. Okay. That uh -huh. has to be. Um, it, within the model. But that is, uh, that is kind of, that is what is observed is generally out to about. <clears throat> um two and a half solar radio maybe three yeah. or so that's mm -hmm. where the there are yeah. closed field lines which contain hot dense plasma relative um to it now those of you who are kind of more familiar with this will uh, look immediately at the in the top uh right the actual uh Im images of the sun the ev cool. image um and you'll recognize that there are dark regions on that which yes. are what are called coronal holes these yeah. are regions that are colder and less dense precisely because the field lines there the magnetic field lines there are open and plasma is able to escape and you can kind of see that at a glance yeah. from our model too you can see yeah regions that where mm -hmm. there's open uh, and they kind of correspond now it's not perfect of course but they correspond at the poles and in some places down below the right. um the right. equator uh, yeah. to the coronal holes cool. so so this is a way and i'm trying to kind of uh, promote this as well as a way at a glance of visualizing the structure of the coronal magnetic field it shows you where where it's closed where it's open cool. um, yeah, so that's that a... and and let me just ask what a I wanna... question. What was the what was the software you used to make that uh, animation on the bottom? Uh, so the the basic software is uh, is it's Python. There's a Python library called okay. Mayavi. Okay. So it's it's just a three okay. D plot now. Um, just to promote a few things. Uh, firstly, to calculate this, you know, now you you're welcome to uh, to visualize it how you like uh, because I'm I'm producing a, a you know a, a general three D file something like an STL or something that. Yeah, yes. many 3D uh, modeling uh, pieces of software can produce, wow. um, but okay. to to actually to actually produce this, of course, you have to look at where the open and closed magnetic field lines are. You have to trace magnetic field lines. Um, so I have a code. Uh, I've developed a code that um, that traces magnetic field lines for many different coronal codes. Nice. This uh, is going to be published in future. Uh, you know, very soon. In fact, the, the code itself is published, but. Um, and it should be able to, so for example, it should be able to take an existing, an output of an existing MHD code and so on, and produce something like this almost directly. And I'm making all that publicly available. Uh, now, the other thing is that um, uh, I, uh, the, the, this this sort of the, the, this plot of the last closed flux surface. I had a student, um, you know, this is this is nice as a kind of scientific visualization. But I had a student uh, come along and make, and again, this is publicly available, um, make a very nice sort of a public, uh, you know, something that looks cool for the kids, yep. as it were, yep. a nice visualization animation yep. using a more uh, kind of more involved, more commercial. Uh, uh, visualizing software so uh, there are there are ways to make nice. this kind of look even more neat um cool. 
Good. Okay. Fair enough. Um, but anyway, so that uh, and the last thing I want to say on this is that, um, as I mentioned, what we have so the the in the top right the these images from the solar dynamics observatory they are you know real tangible they happen at a given time you know a few years ago. Mm -hmm. um, uh, each one has a very specific time that it was taken. And we are matching this with our model. So again, our model also has, of course, you know, it, it has a real time. There's not, there's not just a, an arbitrary sort of simulation, time, uh, right? right? So many units of normalized time. We we are talking about real uh, comparable, yes. right? The 8th of September in our model oh. versus the 8th of September in reality. Right. Uh, now, um, the and, and the the oh uh, the final thing I should say so the we are seeing a, an eruption but there really was an eruption uh, at uh, whatever it was five twenty eight on the eighth of September um, okay. there's another piece of uh, sort of data that I'm not showing here but there are other satellites that observe the sun in the X ray and when they get an X ray spike which they did at that time nice. um, there is a, 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 they have an eruption and so so we were able to in this case really? very precisely to about you know to within an hour or so half an hour to okay. have an eruption happen in our model and in real life now that i must stress that that is probably that level of accuracy is probably fortuitous probably we can't guarantee that level of accuracy but in principle you, you know we, in our models uh, we could probably get you know within a few hours a day or so of a real eruption happening and okay. an eruption happening in in our model of course we're limited by that resolution we don't have infinite resolution uh you know we have we're limited by other uh other problems and other uh, observations <laughs> but but that that's you know that that's what we can get in in this uh, magnetic frictional model love it love it love it love it okay let's go back to the article 53 Right. So, um, yeah, so that's um, uh, that's that. And then the final thing, I guess that we have one more figure. Mm -hmm. um, and this one now, <laughs> if you this one is a bit involved. So this one is really for the for the um, experts for the con well, for the connoisseurs, you know, you really want to <laughs> if you're listening along at home, I'll try and explain it in, in, in general terms. But, you know, you might want to make yourself comfortable get a hot chocolate with some marshmallows or something because i this have hot is... chocolate or actually okay. i have an espresso but okay <laughs> right so this one's going to get a bit involved so right. um uh, and in fact uh, what you might like if you don't mind is just to uh, zoom it can you see how there's a, a yellow border we have you know three figures that are uh, mm -hmm. on one particular date the 28th of mm -hmm. uh, at, the, at the top you if you just zoom in on those three for now maybe just to, those to the top three yeah okay how about Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. So, uh, what we have here, firstly, what are we actually show? What what is what are our you know scales, right? So we're showing three plots, uh, and maybe maybe the the one in the bottom right of this three is is the one to to start with. Okay. Huh? So we have along the bottom we have radius. So yeah. Um, we, we're uh, in that axis. We are moving outwards in radius from one solar radius at the start of our model to two and a half where our model terminates. Okay. In the Y, we have uh, theta, which is the uh, latitude. Okay. And so north to mm -hmm. south. So this this one panel is at a constant longitude. So if you imagine you are you know, uh, I believe, right? You, let's say you're in Dundee, where I am, and you're moving north. And uh, as you're moving vertically in this figure, you're moving north and south. So yes. what we've done is we've taken a sort of annulus from the North Pole down to the South Pole and outwards in radius, a sort of annulus around the sun. Right. And we've kind of stretched it into just, you know, we, we've deformed it into a, a rectangular rectilinear yep. plot. So we have, okay. uh, again, we have radius on the x-axis, uh, uh, latitude on the y-axis okay next um next let me talk about what the colors represent so what uh we have red and blue so let, let's 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 pick let's pick one of the latitudes okay. and let's move outwards let's say zero right so so at okay. the equator that's zero the theta yep. and we're moving outwards in in radius so the red represents closed field Okay. And the blue is open field. So as we move, we first start off in a region where all okay. the magnetic field 
starts and ends on the sun. And as we move outwards to the to the outside, eventually we get to a place where Opens one up. end, or, or in fact, possibly both ends of our uh, magnetic field line do not start on the sun. So it may be it may start on the sun and go oh, outwards yeah. and then out into the into the uh, okay. solar system, or it may uh, it may start on the outside, come into our simulation domain, and leave. So it's a, it's a loop that uh, it's then a loop that never reaches the sun it starts out in the broader solar system right. comes into our simulation domain yeah. leaves so this could be one of those eruptions when an eruption is happening it could be the the bottom of that eruption where yeah. the magnetic field just dips into our simulation domain and out and then there's a closed loop outside the sun okay gotcha. so that's the red versus blue <laughs> and, and what, what is what is what is the technical definition of um, that? Okay. So, so firstly, the the Q is called a squashing factor. This should be familiar, hopefully, to okay. solar physicists. It's a, a squashing factor. I'll explain what the what that actually means. The this slog is signed logarithm. So the sign we keep, and the sign we have positive for closed, negative for open. That's a convention uh, that we have. Yep. Um. So what? But what is the magnitude? What is that? what's called squashing factor what does that represent what does the you know if you have it very red or very blue what does that mean so the squashing factor is a property of the magnetic field um where where it's high it means that the magnetic field is highly um it's either sort of uh it, it's topologically very complicated so it either diverges perhaps or it's very kind of twisted up yeah. it may be very uh you know inhomogeneous so where you have very bright colors where you have a very high uh, logarithm of that squashing factor mm -hmm. uh, in you know in, in, in absolute terms that is where the magnetic field diverges or is uh, is kind of um, ah. very topologically mixed up okay. Okay. so for example okay. for example this quantity formally where you have a, a bit of red touching a bit of blue yes that is the interface. So on one side of that, then you have closed field lines. They they start and end on the sun. Um, on the other side, you have open. So formally there, that this squashing factor Q goes through a singularity, goes to infinity, because those field lines diverge. One goes out to infinity, the right. other curves back to the sun, right? So these are right. these are highly divergent. Uh, magnetic field lines, but uh, so so that so it's 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 infinite there. But you can also have um, either very high or even infinite uh, within one of two colors. So, for example, you might have a closed magnetic field, but one loop goes one way and the other loop goes the other way. Mm -hmm. So you have di it diverging from a point. So there, okay. that quantity is infinite. So this is the, this, of course, shows you where the the closed versus open field line is, but it also shows you where the field is very stressed very tangled up and so on and these are important from the point of view of um, you mentioned uh, magnetic reconnection this should happen right. where you have a very high q um, right. and other kind of dynamics should happen there so when you have an eruption you and we'll see this uh, you will have regions of high q very uh, magnetic field line that's uh, or magnetic uh, magnetic field that is very tangled and very messy and complicated i'm with you very so that was that one yeah. panel. Yeah. Now the other two panels, if you yeah. if you slightly zoom yeah, out, the, the other two that. panels there. Then um, the one on the top is one at uh, constant latitude. Yes. So if you imagine this is one of the like on the Earth, this would be a tropic. This would mm -hmm. be a uh, sort of line around the sun, uh, right, going at a, at a constant latitude, and then out in radius. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so there again we see uh, at lower radii in some places it's open and it's closed and as you move outwards you have these structures that are mm -hmm. uh, you have these kind of domes that are that are closed um, but as you move out in radius it becomes all open um, yes okay exactly yeah exactly and these are these are called um, helmet streamers you can actually see them physically uh, okay. When you when you look at the sun and the corona, especially during an eclipse where the main you know the very bright disk is um, occluded, you can actually see some of these. Now, of course, again, these are kind of um, that this isn't Jim. We've sort of uh, deformed it somewhat um, but because we've made it into this rectilinear plot. In reality, it's this right. kind of annular conical ribbon. Uh huh. Uh, 
but uh, if you uh, if you actually saw this in real life, you could see these kind of um, domes, these sort of spiky uh, uh, regions of closed field. Now, remember the the closed field is typically brighter in in optically because it has more right. plasma and it's denser. Well, that's very cool. I'm going to have to now. I have something to hunt for come April. Uh, okay. Yeah. Exactly. Right. And uh, yeah. So yeah. Uh, uh, and uh, again, uh, just to advertise this, uh, the way to generate these, um, so this was using a, a code that's a bit clunky to actually generate just these plots from our magnetic field. Um, it's using an existing code um, called HQVSEG that was developed, I believe, in France. But I now have a slightly more user-friendly version that will be published. Uh, it has been published, but the paper behind it will be published soon. Lovely. Um, finally, in the the... Yeah, the middle, the larger of the panels there, this is at constant radius. So it's yeah. latitude versus longitude. This is on Earth. This would be called a Mercator projection. Yes. Um, and it is at the uh, at the outside of our simulation domain. 2.5, yep. Mm -hmm. um, you can see it's all blue, meaning it's all open. This is by definition because, of course, once you get to the outside, everything there is kind of open and everything, uh, this is um to do with the that solar wind uh, the yeah the solar wind model the um the parker solution and so on so basically everything once you get to the two and a yes. half solar radius all the magnetic field lines there leave the sun and go out to infinity you know to the wider solar system okay uh so it's all it's all open but the and what the uh the magnitude of the squashing factor there, there are these um, sort of arcs. And um, now there's a, there's a kind of um, going on the left at, at 60. Can you see a sort of, it's a, it's a line, it's white, but then there's blue on either side. There's a kind of line that snakes its way. It starts mm -hmm. at um, mm -hmm. zero, phi equals zero and uh, theta equals zero, and then snakes its way down, if you see what I mean. Um, this one here? No, the, no uh, ab above that. This one. Yes. And can you see how it snakes its yes. way from one side to the other? That is the heliospheric current sheet. That is where the magnetic ah, field um, ah. polarity flips. Oh, yeah, yeah. It is a separatrix because okay. um, magnetic field lines from above it map to one part of the sun, from below it to the other. Mm -hmm. So it is a it is a line of infinite Q. Yeah. Um, because cool. it's cool. Okay. Um, but 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 the there, there are other regions where the magnetic field line uh, or the magnetic field sign may not um, flip, but they are influenced. So these are these are the, the other kind of blue um, arcs and things like that. These are regions where, um, on one side, the magnetic field you know goes to one part of the sun, and on, on the other, it goes to another part of the sun. For that reason, the magnetic field diverges there, and so we have infinite squashing factor, infinite Q there. Okay. Um, and so what this kind of plot in the uh, technical terminology uh, might be called is the separatrix web, the S web. Yes. Uh, so this is a concept in solar physics um, where uh, the this on the outside of the sun, there are these um, kind of the, 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 there are these regions where the magnetic field diverges. Um, they are also, as I mentioned, high Q, high squashing factor corresponds to where uh, magnetic reconnection happens. Mm -hmm. And so because the field is stressed, it's it's, uh, you know, divergent and so on. Um, and so these are regions where it is hypothesized and I've done some work and many others have done work on this where uh, the slow solar wind as opposed yeah. to the fast solar wind, if you're aware of that sort of dichotomy, yes. that's where that is generated. Okay. Um, and, and so on. So cool. this this kind of at a glance tells you the sort of structure of the magnetic field, the really topology of the magnetic field. Mm -hmm. Okay. Beautiful. Okay. So there's a, the three panels. And so, of course, that is that is at one time. That is just at one time. And I'm showing then uh, three days later, uh, it has somewhat changed. Very interestingly, if you go to the, the middle panel, Okay. Um, you can see a kind of pair of little swirls at uh, right phi 120. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. this is where yeah. an eruption has happened and where um, the, these two swirls are the kind of ends of uh, material being ejected 
um, you can see there's a lot of dynamism and so on. So yeah. um, many people are used to the to seeing the separatrix web, maybe from one of those PFSS models I mentioned. This is a very kind of static, as I mentioned. There's no dynamism happening there. Here, it's sure. really busy, dynamic. This is, you know, it's it's very kind of interesting as a as a scientist to see this to see. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's there are there are signatures of reconnection there. There are signatures of, yeah. of plasmas, uh, you know, plasma being ejected and so on. Um, now, oh, okay, so at this point, it might be to to explain the very bottom thing. At this point, it might be worth to to flip to the movie of this. Okay, let's go to the animation on this one. This is a big one. Um, uh, okay yeah fine so what the bottom panel in this case what the bottom panel you'll see there's just red and white and so the red regions in the bottom panel here in, in the movie um they correspond to where the q in the in the um constant radius plot mm -hmm. where the q is above some threshold large amount Okay. So they these are these are regions of high Q. This is what we call a high Q volume. Now we have a, and this is uh, where my, the the co-author Roger Scott. This is uh, very much his work. Um, he's developed an algorithm. Uh, it's not just it, what we're showing you a kind of slice to it, but he's he's calculating where the Q is high in a, a volume in a volumetric sense throughout yes. the entire simulation domain where the Q is high. Exactly. He's also kind of showing, this is a bit technical, but um, he's showing where that high Q is connected to a, um, a null, magnetic null. This is important okay. for, again, reconnection considerations yes. and things like that. Yep. Or where it's connected to multiple nulls. There's a very, um, there's a complicated kind of taxonomy that I, I'm not quite showing here, um, but uh, there is a reference to to some of uh, Roger's other work uh -huh, where good. you get into the full gory details. We'll also publish uh, further studies on this. Great. But what it's what good. I'm showing here is just where the Q is high. Yeah. So this is where um, the that S web is, where you have these regions of perhaps a rapidly uh, reconnecting magnetic field, yeah. where you are having perhaps emission mm. of slow yeah. solar wind. And I'm showing how that change, in this case, I'm showing how that changes in time. Uh, so uh, if we look, if you now watch through, this is looping. If we now watch through one of the loops, we will see some parts, let's say at um, phi equals 240 and theta equals 60. So the top there. Uh, this part here. Uh, no, the phi, phi equals 240 uh, degrees, so kind of 180 degrees right of... Oh, here we go. Where... 240. Yeah. So you can see that arc. That arc is largely unchanged at this time. So if you if we yeah. watch through a whole cycle, it's basically, it stays there exactly as it is. Yeah. But other regions, so let's say a phi 120... Right. right, you can see you can right. see stuff is happening. There's stuff is going on. There is an eruption probably happening. In fact, there is an yeah. eruption. There's probably okay. a corresponding active region. Stuff is happening there. Yeah. So some parts of this uh, separatrix web, this S web, some during this moment at least are fairly stable, fairly unchanging, and other parts are very much in flux, very rapidly changing. Fine. Um. Yeah, right. Okay. And so finally, if we return to the static figure now. Okay. I got it. Okay. Mm -hmm. If we go to the bottom uh, panel, what we now have, what this is now is a sort of um, a kind of synthesis of all that data. So what I'm showing is regions colored. Uh, the, the red is where, where that HQV is only uh, is only appears there for a brief amount of time, and the golden sort of yellow orange is where that high Q volume persists for a long time, for many days. This is only a, a slice of six days, so there's a, okay. six is the maximum. Sure. So what we're showing is some regions that 
the, 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 that S web is very persistent. It's just right. staying there. It's it's fairly static. But in other regions, there's a kind of continuum where it's more dynamic. It changes. It's rapidly evolving. It only persists. Maybe some of it persists for three days. Yeah. Some of it persists for yeah. only briefly. Uh, yeah. Of course, we have a certain time resolution here as well. But so this is um, for the, again, as I say, for the connoisseurs, for the real, um, you know, people who really enjoy this stuff and, and are experts in this field. This should be quite interesting because it's showing a previously rather unstudied uh, aspect of the SOB, just how it evolves, how certain, you know, it, how it, persistent it is, how um, uh, how dynamically it changes yeah. and so on. So, um, yeah, so well, hopefully uh, that sort of answers that so i think i think that's all we have to show so this this last bit as i mentioned a lot of that um is uh very much thanks to uh, roger scott my my uh, co-author and future i'm sure we will be publishing a bunch of papers as well awesome. and i think that kind of brings us to the end uh finally of this paper awesome awesome val i want to thank you so much for walking us through this very awesome letter very cool uh, let's see, and you touched on it uh, a couple of times uh, in various ways. Uh, so first of all, I really look forward to your public releases of these codes to help do this analysis. I think that's great. Um, uh, but where do you think we go from here, uh, given the given the published work? Uh, is there stuff in the way to do a full century or two centuries? How about a millennium uh, of, <laughs> of the sun? Uh, uh, are there plans to do maybe other stars? Is there other observations or analysis to do? So just sort of next steps on where do we go with this topic over the next couple of years? Yes. So first, yes, uh, uh, just over one century is what I can promise. And that is very much in the pipeline. We are, you know, we're funded in part to look at historical data. So we, uh, as I mentioned, what's really limiting us is the knowledge of what's happening at the surface of the sun because we really can't peer any deeper we can't predict when one of these active regions is going to emerge so we have data going back to 1916 so that okay. is the next step okay. for us is going to be to run uh from 1916 to let's say start of 2024 cool. just over a century of course uh of solar activity Again, we very much welcome any inputs. Um, you know, now there's there's a lot of technicals, uh, you know, including, of course, by the the review of this article, asked us certain things. So this doing these forty seven years has helped us to iron out a lot of the kind of technical and some of the you know scientific Ooh, as well right, uh, right. features. So we're now much more, uh, much better informed about what we're looking for in this future century of uh of uh, sun, uh, sun evolution cool. as i mentioned this study has also helped us to write some codes that should be of of a broader uh, use for analysis in particular of the magnetic field and its topology especially um so th this has helped us help us to make that some of that is we're making available some of it is already available uh we'll be certainly in the you know in a very near future we're hoping to uh, publish kind of a, a, a technical description a, a, a very long article to uh -huh. to explain some of these codes for the scientific community to then use um going yes to other stars we do have um now one thing i'm also looking at at the moment is um, I, I should mention that all of this, as many codes, um, this is kind of the, the simulation runs within the uh, the frame of the sun. So the sun is rotating. It's actually rotating differentially, meaning that the poles yeah, yeah. are rotating slower than the, the uh, equator. But within a frame called the Carrington frame, so the average yeah. rotation um, of the sun that we observe, mm -hmm. we're kind of in that frame and we're imagining that the sun is, other than that differential rotation, is not rotating. Right. Um, mm -hmm. But to fully address this in, in this kind of frame, what we need to then do is consider the Coriolis effect and the Coriolis yeah. force, okay. the uh, fictional, fictitious forces that arise from being in a rotating frame. So actually, we're, I'm coding that into the uh, the Dumfret code now. Nice. We will look at that. And as well, now, the I already have early results basically that say that 
uh, we're up to where we're simulating up, up to about two and a half solar radii. The corona rotates largely rigidly. The corona's force is fairly negligible relative to all other forces. It has a very low effect. However, and and you know, so we're gonna um, we're gonna do a full publication sure. on oh, yeah, this. Yeah. We're gonna uh, finish off our studies and you know, cross the t's, dot the i's, whatever on that. Uh, front uh, but what we're going to then do is we're going to try and extend that to other perhaps younger stars that are rotating much more rapidly Ooh. and there we Ooh. do perhaps expect to see some effect yeah, yeah, yeah. from uh ro the rotating corona we'll see um you know that remains to be seen that's uh, we'll report that to you uh, to the scientific community in in due time Cool. Um, yeah. So, and and just finally, again, as I said at the beginning, we, what we really are looking for is any sort of collaborations. Anyone that wants to, you know, suggest something. Do is there some fairly simple uh, like metric or something that we can calculate uh, some derived quantity that as a function of time or do you you know during an eruption something like that. Can uh, is there something that can help you answer a scientific question? Do right. some good science there. Please let us know. Of course, the you know there's a way to contact us. So this is you know this is very much open to the scientific <laughs> community. Yeah, yeah, I think you can find this email in the opening part of the article. So won't be hard to find. Val, thank you so much. That was really awesome. Thank you once again. And that will do, everyone. And I hope this made your astronomy day just a little bit better. And we'll see you on the next one. Bye bye.